I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And this episode of Star Talk, a Cosmic Queries edition, is focusing on neuroscience. And we go to our go to person for that, and that would be the none other. And Heather Boleyn. Heather, welcome back to Star Talk for the millionth time. Thanks. I love, always love being here. You're all excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And you, you're a neuroscientist at uh, Mount Sinai. Is that yes, correct? Yeah. The, the way to say that. Mm -hmm. And you focus on what people are thinking when they don't know they're thinking. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard it described that way. Um, but no, I studied brains and how they relate to human thoughts, behaviors, whether they're conscious or unconscious. Okay. Emotions. That's scary, mm. actually. <laughs> and we have a first timer here, my co-host, Jackie Hoffman. Jackie, welcome. Thank you, Neil. You're a comedian? I am uh, an actress slash comedian. In that order? Uh, sh well, yes. Okay. <laughs> Right now, I'm doing more acting than comedian. Okay. And, and I, I had a hysterectomy at Mount Sinai. Oh, congratulations. That, that's a, it's a TMI. Is that a TMI? <laughs> I hope they did a good job. That I Uterus Awareness Week. <laughs> Uterus Awareness Week. Okay. So I, let me join you in that and say I was born in Mount Sinai. Really? Oh. Yes. Uh, yeah. And both my children were born in Mount Sinai. Okay. But I never had a hysterectomy there. No. That, <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Rolled you into the wrong room. <laughs> So Jackie, you said you also an actress. You were uh, you had a, a, a role in in Legally Blonde too. Yes, Neil remembered my joke, my line. What was it? It was one line: "Your dogs are gay." <laughs> that was your one line in the movie. <laughs> okay, it changed the world. I would have given you more lines than that if I were if I were producer of Legally Blonde too. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> so uh, also you are in a all Yiddish production of Fiddler on the Roof off Broadway right now. That is correct. That's crazy. With English subtitles, don't panic. Okay. Yiddish has got to be like that's how it would have been. They would have been speaking Yiddish. That is correct. Singing and yes. dancing Yiddish. And you your character is Yenta the matchmaker. Yenta. Yes. Yenta. You can't get more Yenta than being Yenta. Or Shadchan, <laughs> as we say in Yiddish. <laughs> so you're basically you're playing my grandmother. Basically what you're playing. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So since this is Cosmic Queries, we solicited from our fan base questions for this episode on neuroscience. Great. And what a topic that has become, Heather. There was a word no one knew 20 years ago, and now everybody's into it. So, I, I mean, I knew about it. Oh, excuse but, me. I mean, oh, there's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, not that nobody knew. Okay. Nobody else knew. Right, right, yeah. And so, uh, Jackie, you have the questions. I haven't seen them. Neither has Heather. Mm -hmm. And these are questions. Let's bring it on. Let's see what we've got. Let's okay, our first comes from John Emerson from Patreon. I don't know what that is. Oh, Patreon. That's our, uh, they're a support website that oh. help fund our operation. Oh, nice. I thought it was a tequila. <laughs> so, that's, so, so that's why you're reading their question first. I see. That's one of the perks of the many perks you get. As being thank a Patreon you, pa supporter. the patrons at Patreon. Patreon. Pa Patreon, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've heard that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Well, that a little bit involves you, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my expertise, Mars and Venus, all right. I've heard that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, but are there any neurological differences between these two planetary species? Ooh. Yeah. It's a good question for Yenta the Matchmaker, too. <laughs> mm. It's actually, it's you know, it's been controversial in the past because often it's not been PC to say that there are differences between men and women's brains, but there are. There are. They're both um, sort of anatomical differences, neurochemical differences, um, hormones that affect brain chemistry like oxytocin, things like test testosterone and estrogen affect how the brain works. So we know that, for example, on average, and these are all, again, on average, women have slightly larger hippocampi, which is the part of the brain that has to do with memory. They tend to store emotional memories better than men. They tend to ruminate on things a little bit more than men, as we might know anecdotally. Um, and in terms of like um, the way their brains are wired up, it's they slightly female. different. Female, mm -hmm. female, yeah. Um, language, which tends to be lateralized, meaning that it's it's more on um, localized on the left side. Lateralized would mean it's featured more. In for anything, would mean more on one side than the other. Exactly. Lateralized. Lateralized. Okay. So it tends to be more lateralized than men, meaning that more of their language is just on the left side, whereas women tend to have language on both in both hemispheres, like pro parts of the brain that are dedicated to language processing. They tend to use more words just in behaviorally during the day than men. So um, there are certain aspects of women's brain, both anatomically and 
and physiologically that differ from men and they express themselves in different ways behaviorally emotionally in terms of cognition so has this gotten resistance from society to even have that conversation there's some you know because yeah. then the idea is like well you know well then there's this this myth like okay well if a, a bigger brain must be better men on average have a physically larger brain but that's not true in terms of intelligence in terms of cognitive function it's about how it's wired up it's not about mm -hmm. the size so but people did get scared away from this because the idea like you know famously um, I think it was Larry Summers at Harvard who said like or you know then that, president of Harvard yes, yes exactly you know women on you know don't tend to not be do as well in like math and and tech and that kind of thing and those things are just not true mm -hmm. um, they they tend to work in different ways but they're not there's no differences in terms of in, intelligence and correlated to brain size and the rest so I think it's okay to say there are differences um, and it's neither good or bad it's just different so I thought his his argument was the averages are all the same, but mm -hmm. men show up wider on mm -hmm. the distribution. So if you try to find the highest performing man, it comes way out on the high performing side. You also have a mm -hmm. much lower right. man on the other side, lower than you find the lowest woman. They tend to be more on the extremes. extremes with the, right, yeah. right. But again, that's, you know, on average. So that means that there are women who are mm -hmm. at these extremes as well on average tend to be more at the men more at the extremes in uh -huh. terms of that bell curve of, of IQ um, but if you look at it overall or bell curve of anything yeah. right I mean yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, isn't the shortest person ever a man is that true? I, 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 Tom Thumb, I thought, was oh, pretty small. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know if that means that in, I don't on know. average, I, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very, you know, an N of one. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but um, women tend to live longer than men. So in that right. sense, we are at the extreme. We also look at, look at a personality, um, like, for example, um, uh, charisma, right? Mm -hmm. There's some very charismatic men out there. Mm -hmm. And at the other extreme, you have completely, com complete sociopaths. Right. As men, men are do the most heinous social things ever, right? So, you, so, so again, we have these extremes that the men or they are might, overpopulating, right? Or they just might express them in different ways. Like one idea, just to go off a little bit on a tangent, but people who are men, sociopaths, men, mostly more diagnosed in men, um, have these kinds of impulsive behaviors, or they act out aggressively in others, and then they're categorized as that. But women also can tend to have those extreme behaviors, but they're more likely to be introverted and acted out on themselves like self-harming oh, behavior. Oh, okay. So there's similar um, expressions uh -huh. of like, let's say, impulsive behavior, but they're expressed different ways and then they get categorized into different um, disorders. So Jackie, are you from Mars or Venus? Which are you? Uh, Saturn. Saturn. Me too! <laughs> Me too! <laughs> Me too! Thank you. Excellent. Put a ring on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Beyonce. <laughs> hey, Jackie, got another question. Yes, I do. Here's one close to my heart. Mm -hmm. From Herbalvores on Instagram, how do psychedelics work and what is the effect on the brain? And Ooh. for personal reasons, I'd like to extend that question to marijuana as well. Okay. Wait, uh, did you just add that to the question? I did. Am I okay. allowed to do that? <laughs> yeah, you, you're, you're, you, you control the questions. You, if you want to slap in your I own showed question. up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's a pretty broad question. There, there, there is a whole variety of different types of psychedelic drugs, and they all affect the brain in different ways. So it's not. Let's like, take them. Let's just go LSD. Okay. Let's just let's do just go LSD. Okay, LSD, that's a good nice one. and clean, nice and one. famous. Yeah. Okay. So what LSD does, um, in general, is that it lowers activation in certain parts of the, the frontal lobe, which have to do with kind of, um, you have sensory information coming in and the frontal lobe is kind of making meaning out of that information so that it, are, it makes sense of it all. But when you have decreased activation in that part of the brain, the kind of meaning maker part of the brain, you're having a whole bunch of sensory information coming in without a filter, let's say. Um, so it's being an, experienced in a different way. You also have increased activation in the limbic areas of the brain, these subcortical areas of the brain. So more information is coming from within. It's not being sort of organized in, or in a logical way. Is limbic, is that the, the like reptilian? Emotional thing? reptilian brain, exactly. Um, and the other thing, so it is almost like being in a dream state because during dreams we see a similar pattern of activation, right? You have decreased prefrontal cortex, increased limbic. So you're having 
emotions and thoughts that don't necessarily make sense, that don't have a clear narrative. Um, but you're also getting this, this, this sensory information that's unfiltered. And the other thing that's really interesting is that when you look at the way um, the brain is kind of sending information back and forth, usually it's in a very kind of, you have certain pathways that, that the brain sends information. But when they're in, when they're on LSD, there's much more distributed network of information. So it's kind of like you'd see these a lot of straight lines and paths, and now they're crossing larger um, distances within the brain, the information. So it's just a whole different pattern of activation. Mm. Mm. So that makes you feel weird and trippy. Yeah. Well, when we have time later, yeah. I'll ask you about oh, all the... my prescriptions and <laughs> their effect, their effect on what's left of my. First, tell us what you're on right now. That's what we want to know. For... The, the, the point, though, I think that's the most interesting is that we all are kind of hallucinating all the time, right? Our wow. Brain, yeah, because our brain is making up a story based on these like signals that are coming in, and then we often say that when we all agree upon it. We call it reality. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is a fascinating and important point mm -hmm. because if you have your own understanding of reality and no one else can corroborate it right that's just we we declare that it's going on in your head we don't declare that you have some special insight into a reality that none of the rest of us have right is that fair to say I as, would as from a brain person's perspective we all are making up our reality in our mind but again if if nobody else is agreeing on what you're experiencing then it's likely just being generated internally and, and scientifically we have to assume that otherwise what you know what, what do we base reality on? What do we base reality on? Yeah. on? Tree falls in a forest and nobody <laughs> hears it. Does it make a noise? Is this why you asked about the marijuana? <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect segue to this next question. Well, I don't know if I'm done with this. Wait a minute. All right. So, so yeah. what do you say to people who would argue that when their brain has been altered by whatever, peyote, mm -hmm. artificial chemicals, whatever, ayahuasca, whatever, mm -hmm. that they're claiming insight Right. Into the into the universe. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? I've had these discussions with people. So they let's say they claim they say they see a spirit God and they get insight into the workings of the universe. I think it's important to understand that we are our brains are a physical mechanism. Um, and a lot of things, just like dream states, are it's creating its own um, internal world. And so often when we're in a fully awake, non-psychedelic state, where there's a certain part of our brain that tells us whether information is being internally generated or, or coming from externally. Sure. And when you're people with schizophrenia, for example, they don't have that proper check in place. So they think they're hearing voices that are coming externally in because they're not, their brain isn't telling them, no, it's you internally being generated. So... When you're on these drugs, it's similar like when to a schizophrenic, things are being generated internally from your mind, but you're misinterpreting them as coming from someplace else, like from a spirit god or mm -hmm. somewhere else, and that, or maybe you're getting some great insight that's coming from somewhere. So the people talking to themselves on the street and who are not on a cell phone, mm -hmm. they're really talking to themselves. <laughs> 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 they're not yes. talking to some other entity. But they are imagine, but they experience it as if it's another entity. Yeah. 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 Um, but I mean, look, this is not to say that there isn't some great uni like you know, answer that's coming through in different ways. But it is curious that while well, people who get these messages when they're on in these psychedelic states are usually related to their underlying personal or religious belief systems mm. that they have in place already. It folds in together with it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Which makes me, which leads me to believe that it's internally generated, not externally. Very good data on that. Thank you very much, Jackie. <laughs> What you got next? Well, I've got this real trippy one from Ooh. Kevin Kalakimaka on Instagram. Okay. Is everything we experience a figment of our imagination? Pretty but much. That, that dovetails that's right sort of, in. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. pretty much that's pretty much it. I mean, I wouldn't say everything we experience a figment of our imagination. Wait, if I pinch no. you, that's not no. No, that imagination? A, the way I experience it is created by my brain. Imagine it, it actually I'd have to say no because Imagination. I says yes or no. Come on. Okay. Well, <laughs> make up your mind. What am I, like, no. Moving on. <laughs> Senate hearings. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay. <laughs> Did you have you, Kevin? Ever... What are you thinking? <laughs> no, no. So let me let yeah. me insert something. Okay, here. okay. In the movie The Matrix. Yes. Everything is happening inside their brains. Yes. Their sense of pain and joy and love and hate and hunger and all of that is inside the brain. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that is true. So everything you experience is pain. Every sensation you have is happening inside of your brain, right? Yes. But so therefore, to the question, mm -hmm. is so, so the answer to that is yes. Everything is 
a brain experience in your life. And and you couldn't have had a plausible plot in the movie The Matrix unless that was true. Yeah, but when you say, when when this is the differentiation I'm making, imagination in the sense of not correlating to something that's external to your brain. So you can you have a creation of an experience in your brain of what you're perceiving that could either be created internally, which I would call imagination, or that's coming externally from your senses in. And so, yes, they're both creations of your brain, but one is based on external data and the other coming And from the externality within. is where we all rally around to say that's the reality. Yeah, but, but, but the truth be told, we could create a whole sort of matrix world just based on sensory inputs that and, aren't and really what's that there. other movie uh, total recall mm. you want to go on a you you want to go on a vacation to Acapulco mm -hmm. sit in this chair and i will implant the memories of it in you and now you wake up and say wow i had a good time yeah, in Acapulco. I mean, it, is, it is just as good it could give you it could be just <laughs> as good we are beginning better. to blur the line or better or probably better, better. probably better <laughs> probably if better. you can know how to do it because you can skip all the boring parts like the We're, taxi ride and <laughs> waiting for your luggage <laughs> exactly all right like yeah. fast-forwarding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but with your brain. Yes. <laughs> Time for one more for this segment. What do you have, Jackie? Ooh, that's a tough choice, but I think I've got one. Brian's side on Instagram. If sight is the process of the brain creating an image of reality after it interprets the signal from the eyes sent when they interact with the electromagnetic mm -hmm. field, can a blind person create an image based on the signal sent from the other senses to the brain? In other words, can a blind person see something? Yeah, mm. yeah. So it uh, depends on... Okay, so our brain Wait, you is, know something? What? That's a really good question. Should I wait till after and, the break? Uh, yeah, I want right. to wait till after the break Let's for the it. answer to that question. Mm, cliffhanger. And uh, since the word electromagnetic was mentioned in there, oh. I would just say that's the word we use to describe the entire spectrum of light. Not only the visible light, Roy G. Biv, mm. red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, but the infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, microwaves, radio waves, all of that is the electromagnetic spectrum. Only a tiny slice of it are we sensitive to with our eyes. So what's interesting is we have this mechanism called our eyeballs that takes that and turns it into an image, and it's all neurological at that level. Well, once, you, once your people get good at neurological stimulus, I don't see why you can't take any external stimulus and turn it into an image in a brain, even of someone who is blind. And we had went to our go-to neuroscience person, Heather Berlin. Heather, yes. very nice. I got Jackie Hoffman, a first-timer, as my yes. co-host. Plus, you... Tweet at Jackie Hoffman 16. I do. What is the 16? I don't know. My manager picked it because there was another Jackie Hoffman. <laughs> That's your query cosmic answer. Wow. Cosmic with a K. That is the lamest answer I've ever I know. heard. No, it's the truth. Ever. Heather, you're tweeting. I'm honored to have the lamest answer ever on this show. <laughs> Heather, you tweet at Heather Berlin? Heather underscore Excuse me, Berlin underscore. because the same reason. <laughs> yeah, I don't like the underscore. It's so ugly. What? Because you have to keep changing your what keyboard. Because you? sometimes so you can't work. see it. I, I prefer the dash. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've never well, been an underscore now guy. it's a little bit too late, but yeah, you okay. could have told me that before. Okay. She's <laughs> worth it, though. She's so worth the <laughs> extra worth the keys. Underscore. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie, for the endorsement. So we, le <laughs> we last left off uh, with a question about can you... I'm going to slightly rephrase the mm -hmm. question. Knowing that we have multiple senses into the brain, can you take one sense and turn it into another mm -hmm. to possibly grant the sense of sight back to a blind person? Okay. But maybe the sense of smell or touch. Or, and isn't there this brain, we call it a disorder, called synesthesia? synesthesia. Yeah. yeah. Does that relate to this answer? There's a lot here. So let me just okay. say that it depends on when the blindness occurred. So when you're born, it's in, in many ways, it's the gray matter. It's like a blank slate. And then it starts to differentiate based on the inputs it's getting. So the visual cortex in your brain gets inputs from the retina via the optic nerve, um, sends information. And then over time, it keeps getting inundated with that visual information. So it starts to become the visual cortex where you experience visual imagery. Now, there are experiments, let's say, with, with, with weasels where they take them early on and they redirect that visual information to the audit, what's normally the auditory cortex. Oh. And over time, they start to see with their auditory cortex. Whoa. Okay. So you can, depending on how you change the inputs to the brain, you can, you can kind of change what sensory processes. So there's a malleability if it happens early. Early. Okay. Right. Now, now if you take an adult blind person who's already kind of formed their, uh, 
sensory parts of their brain. Um, what you might experience is that if they were born blind and now, now they're an adult, they have what we do see in, in people is that they have a, a more well developed auditory cortex because they're getting much more auditory input. Well, they're relying on it more. They're relying on it more. Um, there and they, it kind of recruits other parts of the brain, and some can sort of have a weird sense of seeing via um, sound. So they experience it in different ways. Um, and the other, the other part of this is that you there are, there is there are programs now like neural implants where you can actually they can get information from the real world like through a camera um, directly you implant it directly into the visual cortex and it'll stimulate the visual cortex as if it's information coming from the eyes. And people can begin to sort of start to see strange sort of images, not like seeing the way you and I do, but anything is better than exactly, seeing nothing. Exactly, exactly. Right. And as you perfect this um, technology over time, we might be able to really stimulate the parts of the visual cortex so the person can see. We, we already do that now uh, auditorially with the in, in cochlear, cochlear. Co cochlear device. Yes. A NASA invention, I might add. Ah, yes. all things come from NASA. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. And uh, there's a famous talk show host who got the NASA, that got that NASA implant, and is uh, Rush Limbaugh. He was going Whoa. deaf. Oh. I only learned this recently. He went like almost completely deaf, and then he got the operation, which so it it actually hears for you and trans and 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 converts external sound waves into impulses that your your um, ear canal would have otherwise done. Yeah. And I, I don't think you hear the sound as you normally would. But you can hear differences in sounds that you retrain to learn what a word is mm -hmm. when you hear those um, impulses. And can, can I say one thing about synesthesia? Yeah, it's really sure. Cool. Sure. Um, so synesthesia is where people um, sort of have a crossing of sensory um, um, areas in the brain. So, for example, they'll they'll see um, colors in sounds or something. They'll they'll um, hear things in in written text. It's it's a very and so this one study was really interesting where they found that certain people always saw like letters as certain colors. Like an A, they'd be like A is is obviously red. Like obviously, B of is blue. C is green, whatever it was. And what they did is they did a large study across all these synesthetes um, who had that particular... Synesthetes? Yes. Thinis That's a thing? That's um, a thing. Synesthetes. There's a whole community of synesthetes. Um, and they all, they did a survey and they all saw A as red and B as blue. And it was a strange sort of coincidence, we thought. And then they all happened to be born around the same time when this particular Fisher Price, you know those magnets that you would put on the like refrigerator Whoa. and the letters, the numbers. letters and numbers, Whoa. yeah. And their synesthesia to directly correlated with that Fisher Price set that Whoa. came out when they were kids. So basically, when their brain was in the early stages of development and they were exposed to it, they learned an association between those colors and letters, which remains into adulthood. So it had to do with a cross wiring in the brain. Wow. Yeah, maybe that's why I associate every letter with food because they were on the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> on the refrigerator. So I have. A is I am an amblyopete. I have amblyopia. In my right eye. So what I understand is now my brain is not telling my eye to look at things. It sits there like a useless hulk and my whole life is on my left side. I have no vision out of the right eye. When I cover the left eye, it can look at things, but my brain is not talking to it. Oh, it, well, you were born with this. I was born with it. So Ambliotopia? Ambly Ambly <laughs> amblyopia. Ambly ambliopia. I just called myself an ambliopete be just to keep up with the just, just so you can hang. You just want to hang with the There's other people. There's a peeps. whole community. Everybody, ambliopete. <laughs> everybody tweet at you who's an ambliopete. Um, you can be all build a community. Of, but no, I think that, so basically it's interesting, you can only see out of it when you cover the other eye? Is that yes, what you're Yes, that's saying? correct. Um, but you probably can, it probably is getting visual information in. Right. But the other eye is dominant. Yes, so, the doctor said if, God forbid, anything happens to the good eye the bad eye will grow and exactly, learn exactly exactly mm. it's almost like it's it's a it's basically like a lazy eye that it, it, it because the other eye is so dominant you kind of over time don't utilize the information coming from that eye and the other one becomes stronger the other one becomes weaker right. and when so, i was a yeah. child they covered it with patches the good eye to try to strain right. it was pointless i just kept walking into furniture <laughs> which would explain a lot <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about head injury in the next segment <laughs> next what do you have okay from Serena Rockauer on Instagram, what will it take to bring mental health awareness into the mainstream? Why is it still such a stigma? What is it about intelligence in unconventional ways that makes it so taboo? 
Mm. Um, okay. I don't understand the second half of that. What does it have I to do with intelligence? I think that's probably more of a like why some people say that people with mental illness are just intelligent in different ways. I think oh. that's probably related mm-hmm. to that. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that yeah. Tell me about the history of mental, the stigma of mental. Illness, yeah. the history of that because it's sort of a, a, a invisible disorder in the sense like if you break an arm it's very clear it's a physical problem or you know your the heart is having problems that you can look at the physicality and the brain is so complex and there's so much going on in terms of neurochemicals and neurophysiology that when things go wrong in the brain they're hard to just look at and see physically and they express themselves in these sort of subjective states. A person, you never can really tell if they're depressed. They tell you, I feel depressed. Right. Yeah, they and give you a scale. So, one to ten. What are you? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so it's all subjective. And because of that subjectivity, people have questioned the validity of it. Because you can't take a microscope and see it. So now as a cognitive neuroscientist who works in psychiatry, part of what we do is to say, look, these psychiatric illnesses, this is the underlying brain dysfunction. And we need to get away from the stigma like it's all just in your mind, like it's not a real physical thing. And say, no, the brain is a physical organ, just like you would fix a bone with a cast. If the brain is is pro- improperly working, you can take this particular medication that's going to say affects your serotonin receptors. It's just another physical problem. Mm. But because it expresses itself in a subjective way, um, there's a stigma behind it. Uh, so I think we're starting to get away from that. I stigma. would think so too. Be- yeah. And I, you know what I base that on? Mm-hmm. How candidly people just say, "Oh yeah, my therapist told me the other day." Right. When growing up, you would never tell anyone that you had a therapist for any reason. Yeah. And now so. just people just they're just out with it. Yeah. People yeah. you just meet. Right, and so for me, that's an, one measure of of an acceptance factor. Yeah, that's going on. It in can society. also manifest itself in embarrassing ways too. Mental illness, you know, someone on the street can, you know, right. I do that for a living. So <laughs> right. Oh yeah, yeah. Really, you bark at people. That's what you yeah, do. <laughs> yeah, but I do bark at people for a living. But yeah. you know, I think that creates such a stigma, and it's frightening. It's frightening that could be me, and it's fright. It's it's just what mm-hmm. what is that? You can't people, predict the next alarming. moment of their behavior. People yeah. use those extreme cases, you know, like I worked with psychiatric patients in the in the um, ER um, at Bellevue at one point, and these were really severe. These are people, you know, those are the ones you pull off the street and you bring them in the psych ER and they're really out there. You, you strap them down. Right? And yeah. Or you give them something to calm them down. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, and, and so people look at those extremes and say, wait, am I the same as that, you know, like paranoid yeah. schizophrenic? And, you know, to be honest, I've, I've worked with paranoid schizophrenics who are not at that extreme who are really like nice decent people and they just happen to be having these you know strange delusions and we can change it with drugs which is amazing you can give mm-hmm. them a drug and they no longer have these sort of crazy better living ideas. through chemistry yeah <laughs> not that i'm a huge <laughs> proponent of drugs but i think you know if it's broken you have to find ways to fix it excellent yeah jackie what else you got for us okay loving this monica stewart from facebook i had a brain tumor a meningioma the size of a baseball removed through a craniotomy last year. How could it get so big before affecting my motor function, speech, memory, etc.? What do we know about brain tumors in general? Y'all are my heroes sending love from Texas. Texas. <laughs> Texas in the house. That's a good question. So, so Heather, yeah. Of course, in c- Texas, they grow their tumors bigger. <laughs> <laughs> of course, everything's bigger. Everything's bigger in Texas. <laughs> you got a baseball-sized tumor. Everybody else has got a, got a golf, ball. Uh, golf ball-sized yeah, yeah. tumor. So, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, it's not just in the brain. Tumors in other parts of people's body, they don't even know. Yeah. Until they go out there, and then it's always analogized to a fruit or an, or an athletic right. football. So what's going on there? Well, this is it depends on where the tumor is. Menin, men, what did she say she had? A meningioma? Yes. Yeah. So that grows in the meninges of the brain, which is basically I like... I could have guessed that. that ob- <laughs> yeah, you could have you got that one. That was, was an easy one. I, I could. At a multiple choice test. <laughs> you would have got that I one. I would have gotten that one right. The meninges is the a meninges. Meninges the meninges are the basically like the sort of membrane covers around the brain okay. um, and you can get these growths. That, so it's not directly in the sort of brain tissue but what happens is it can get really big and the problem is it starts putting pressure on the brain. So depending on where it's located, if it was located right next to where like let's say the language area was and it started pressing and pressure, you might start having problems with your language. So, de- But depending, it could be in an area where it's relatively benign and that you won't get these immediate um, problems or memory problems because those are sub You're saying areas. it was putting pressure on an unimportant part of her brain. Well, I mean they're all important but sometimes they <laughs> That's what don't. you just said. You just Express. said, uh, Jackie, didn't she just say that? Uh, well, a less verbal part of the brain. I was listening with my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> which one? Which, yeah, which one? The good one. The good one. Um, 
Yeah, so it depends on where it is that it will express itself in ways that are obvious to you. Like it might express itself in other ways and it, it might be that, you know, the pressure over time, you'll start having other symptoms like headaches or, but not necessarily the ones like motor problems. But the different types of tumors, so there's some tumors like um, glioblastoma, which is very deadly, which is growing inside the brain tissue. And That's it's in the getting, glioplast part of the brain. Well, exactly. <laughs> very, oh, good job, Neil. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um, okay. But that's more insidious and it gets in kind of the nooks and crannies and actual cortex and that's when we go in to remove it you can never really get all of it because there's these tiny little tentacles that Ooh. get in so they always grow back they grow back and that's why Ooh. people don't usually tend to live longer than a year after Ooh. that so and, and with the meningiomas like 90% of them are benign which is also good that's so you good. can remove it and, and usually it won't grow back um, but yeah there's, okay. so there are a whole variety of different tumors that have different effects on interesting the brain. cool and, and kind of ideally want one to have an effect to affect you at the smallest stage it can so that you can get to it sooner. Yeah, so that's the whole thing. That's it's, the thing, Yeah, right. Yeah, because... Yeah, so, so maybe a smaller mm -hmm. tumor would have given her motor motor problems or speech problems. If something's wrong, oh, mm -hmm. the tumor is a golf ball right. rather than a baseball. But, but sometimes they don't even go in and remove... If it's like benign, um, they mm -hmm. might wait a while to go in and remove it anyway, okay. even when they find it. Because there's some risk with surgery, depending on where it's located. Is know? risk opening up your skull and... Just poking around your brain? Little, really? Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Jackie. Bad. What else you got? My uterine one was 22 centimeters, by the way. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a dude. Okay. Uh, <laughs> why does the brain... Oh, this is from... And that's the end of my story on Instagram. Why does the brain create images in the form of dreams when we sleep? Do dreams have meaning or function, or are they just a random collection of images? What are the physiological advantages of dreaming? Thank you from Nikki Hush. Nikki, good question. Mm. Gotta do that fast, or okay, or give me part of the answer, and then we save the rest of the answer for. Should I give you part of the segment. question? How about this? Uh, uh, Let me give a short version of that question. Okay, we can answer that before the break, and okay. then you give me give the. The long answer. The, the, the long answer to the longer question. <laughs> okay. So, people want to believe that their dreams give them insight into some future events. The dreamers, they, they, my sense of that is the answer is no. But people feel like they have access to the future through their dreams. Why? After the break. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. Neuroscience. Our go-to person, Heather Berlin. Wow. <laughs> go-to person now. I like, go -to, it. go -to. I like it. Go-to. Go-to. Uh, and Jackie Hoffman. Comedian Hello. extraordinaire. Your go-away-from person. <laughs> <laughs> so, we left off. Someone asked... Uh, about dreams? About dreams. Yeah. And all I can think of is... Uh, uh, Sigmund Freud's book mm. on the interpretation of dreams. Where, where, where have we come since then? Yeah. So I think Freud was right in certain things and not in others. He was, he was certainly on point with his whole theories of repression and dissociation and suppression. I think his interpretation... And also uh, uh, subconscious, right? Oh, yeah. That, of course, id, ego, super ego, yeah, yeah, unconscious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That whole... That was good. The whole theory of consciousness and unconscious processes. However, his whole interpretation of dreams was kind of fringy. I tried reading it. It was like, this is all bullshit. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it yeah. is. I'm sorry guys but um so but the, there's a lot of theories about why we dream i mean the, the the shortest answer is that it's it's random neural firing and you, you only dream during REM sleep by the way so when your brain is in a certain you go through different stages REM, of sleep uh, rapid eye movement exactly or the yeah. rock group <laughs> REM, that's yeah, true. Okay. I never thought of them that way. That's it. Oh, anyway, that's what so, it stands. That's yeah, why they name themselves why that. REM. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Good You're a nurse. You didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Well, I just schooled you I on know. REM. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. But um, there are different stages of sleep, like deep sleep, and mm -hmm. then you know your brain goes. But when it's in the um sort of this dream state, it's almost like a waking state. Um, and so your brain, in a way, is, is conscious of what's going on. It, not always. Sometimes you, you dream, you don't remember you dreamt, right? But usually you're dreaming in that state. And it's random firing of the brain. It doesn't make sense. Wait, wait. If you dreamed and don't remember you dreamed, then how do you know you dreamed? Well, you can look at it. You don't know. <laughs> it's like a tree. Is this the tree question? But in dream <laughs> I bet form, you said you dreamed, but you don't remember. Then well, how did yeah. you know you dreamed? Well, you don't know. But we assume. Was it your electrodes again? That, yeah. You say, well, they're dreaming. There's an interesting case, just side note, there's a case of people who like don't remember things. They only have a short memory. And mm -hmm. so they just feel like they're just waking up and being conscious for the first time every minute because they keep like refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. Wow. So, but I mean, you could have a conscious experience and not remember it, but it's still, you had that experience in the moment. But the point is that these dreams don't, a lot of it is 
the cleaning out. Um, so you take in a lot of information, a lot of stimulation during the day, and then the brain has to decide what's important enough to reinstantiate, to keep, and to reinforce, and to kind of throw away. Reinstantiate? Or reinforce. That's a word? Yeah. I, I don't know. Did I make it up? I might have made it up. Or just instantiate? Uh, no, I just, I it was know. all new. I'm Every syllable of that this. word, it was new to me. I might okay. have made up a word. No, that's I do fine. That sometimes. I like made up words. But you get what After I'm saying. After you instantiate the first time, <laughs> you reinstantiate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Okay. I bet you it's a real word. Um, so what it does is it reinforces the important information and consolidates. That's a better word. It consolidates the information. And then it gets rid of other stuff that's sort of junky. And so in that whole process, your brain is firing, there's neurons firing, and there's, if you're in one of those brain states during sleep where you're sort of conscious, that information is going to manifest itself in a kind of a dream state. It's going to be based on things you've been exposed to in your life. It's going to be based on memories, things that your brain has, information your brain has taken in over the course of your life or over the course of the day. So you'll place meaning on it when you wake up. You'll try to make sense of it because that's when the prefrontal cortex is re-engaged. Remember mm. that meaning maker part of the brain. But in the actual dream, it's more like a flow state or like what we see in people who are in flow states or meditative states or psychedelic drugs. Whoa. So I hope that answers the question. I don't know. There's a lot. I mean, you could have a whole series on dreams. Okay, so suppose there are people who don't dream or don't remember any of their dreams. Are they less mentally... Uh, with it? Uh, well, in, in other words, are dreams yeah. good to remember or bad to, to, to even matter? Well, one theory is that it's a threat rehearsal so that you can actually um, work out things in your dream states that help you in real life. For survival? Yes, oh. for survival. So there is some aspect of it that might be important to help people for survival in the sense that it's a good thing. And some people have recurring them. dreams. Right, Those right. And that might be... With, and then Freud might have it right there where there's some issues that are being issues. suppressed that they yeah. might want to work out. Okay. In their so is it false that we do dream every night? We just don't always remember it? Or... I mean, the theory is that we dream every night. Again, it's very oh. hard to prove, but we don't oh. we don't always remember it. Um, and there is some validity. I don't want to like throw Freud completely under the bus. That when you have in the waking state certain suppressed memories and thoughts, that the, when the prefrontal cortex is on, it can keep things at bay like emotions and memories. And when it's released, releasing that inhibition, you can those things can come to the surface and they can come out in dreams, like things that you normally are not aware of in your waking state. Okay. So it is a way to access the unconscious, but not to like predict the future. I have actors' <laughs> nightmares constantly. Oh, really? What? Like anxiety no. dreams that actors have, and it's a real thing. Like you're on stage? You're, and you, you don't remember your lines, you don't yeah. know why you're there, you don't know what you're in. La mm -hmm. My last one was I sang something wrong and the composer and lyricist were right in my... One good eye line. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So that's just yeah. your normal, like your anxieties and fears manifesting themselves. Wait, do, do you have like, those dreams in Yiddish? I don't that enough during the day. Because <laughs> your, your character is Yiddish? I dream in color, but not in Yiddish. <laughs> not in Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> I dream from right to left. <laughs> <laughs> For those just joining us, Jackie mm. is Yenta in Fiddler on the Roof in an all Yiddish version. Uh, With English subtitles. English subtitles. <laughs> okay. Don't panic. All right, give me another one. Okay. Here's a quickie. This is good from Arik Subramanyam on Instagram. Do you need a brain to feel pain as we know it? Do jellyfish, for instance, feel pain? Good. Oh, I question. like that. I like that. Yeah. So you you don't need a or, brain. Or a lobster, because pe people yes. eat oh, lobsters. Yes. They scream when you put them well, in the water. Yeah, but you know that actually it's illegal now in the EU to um, cook lobsters alive. Because we claim them, they're they're conscious. There's enough evidence that they experience pain and oh. that they have consciousness. So you don't. The, the so instead of putting them in the boiling water, you, you kill, kill them, them some other first, way. First, yeah, and then you can more I mean, compassion. But what? Think you can, also, um, octopus. I think that's what it is as well. You can't. You can't. Um, also kill an octopus in a way that because we know that they're very smart and very conscious. So is there a neurological primitivity? Where you would say they're not really feeling this pain no, in so, some animal out there. Okay, so so the answer is you don't need a brain. You you do need some sort of nervous system. Oh right, of course system. you can have a nervous right. system without a brain. Without a brain, and so like a jellyfish has that in its tentacles. There's the, it ha kind of has like a neural net, and so if you give it some noxious stimuli or you like poke its tentacle, it will move away. It will retract. So Therefore, it's, it's, it's it feels feeling it. pain. Yeah. yeah, I mean you know as we always say, you know I don't. Earthworms know. will move away from pain. Right. So it's about like um, that. That's how we kind of have to measure it behaviorally because even with the human, you know, the pain, again, it's a subjectivity. You go to the hospital, you you know, something's wrong. They say, okay, on a scale of one to ten, how painful is it? No, right? now they have a smiley face or a oh, sad yeah, that's face. Oh, right, yeah, Because <laughs> people, the numbers, just, the numbers. They couldn't handle the numbers. The, the numbers <laughs> were too, <laughs> too much, too much. It's got to simplify. Um, but... 
Yeah, so we don't know, but we can tell, okay, look, you retract as if you're feeling pain. So I, I was at a home meeting where we were talking about animal consciousness and how low down the sort of food chain does it go. And we had a whole discussion about fish and fish, can they feel? And the, and the answer is yes. I mean, they, again, they have a noxious stimuli. They'll retract from it. They have, they record a memory, so they'll avoid that stimuli again. So it's as if they're experiencing something. So how do they kill the lobster before you cook it? I don't know. Lethal injection. <laughs> Lethal injection. <laughs> by the way, by the way, we had on Star Talk, I interviewed the founder of PETA. Oh. And many people associate PETA with just being, you know, all veggie, no killing of animals. Uh -huh. To hear her speak, the philosophy was very different. It was not that she's against killing animals. Mm -hmm. She's against the infliction of pain on animals. Mm -hmm. And I said... Well, what about lobsters? She said she has people working on some kind of anesthetizing first pass at mm -hmm. the lobster before you then put it in the boiling water. Yeah. Just to show you the purity of that mission statement that it's, and so I bet you if there was a package of that sold next to lobsters, people would buy it, of course. Yeah. You, you would, of course, I think people would do that. Um, if you, if you're rich enough to buy the lobster, you got enough money to buy the lobster anesthetizer. Yes. Before you, you cook it. And just wait, minor correction. I think it's the, the illegality in the EU is of first octopus or octopi. I never know what. Octo octopoid. Octopoid. Yes. Um, not lobsters. I just remember that in the recesses of my okay. mind. So you can still horribly damage a lobster when you boil it alive. However, um, the, I think that the real issue is about how animals are treated. And if they are killed in a way that doesn't cause them drama or or uh, trauma or stress, the drama, and drama. <laughs> the dr we don't want drama either. <laughs> the drama queen. I do. Exactly. <laughs> or like you know, Temple Grandin. We have an actor here oh. who wants drama. <laughs> yeah. Um, Temple well, can Grandin. I, can I tell you, yeah. my, my yeah. drama? I've been a drama. Mm -hmm. I know it's lame, but I still do it. Mm -hmm. Anytime I cook a lobster, before I put it in the water, I remove Aww. the rubber bands from I the claws, it. so that it can. Tr Try to bite me as its one last act of survival. You, that is like really sadistic. No, I think. No, 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 <laughs> you went no, deep saying, into that lobster if, mind. If I'm cooking alive, at least give it a chance to fight back. Aww. So I take off the rubber bands and then it, they, they pop open, the claws oh, pop God. open, and then it can try to bite me. And, and I have to then triumph over of course i do because wow. wow. i'm smarter than a lobster so you give him one like fighting chance. one last chance it's just <laughs> it's it's my so own so he can die with dignity, with dignity. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you thank you oh my god yeah. well, okay so the, tell me tell me about temple Grandin. i was just gonna say temple Grandin. who by the way was been a guest on star talk oh, she's great one of my, my favorite shows oh so interesting. temple Grandin. so she she has autism and she was sort of very much aware of, of she can sort of empathize with how the animals were feeling and she created this whole system of when they go to slaughter um, that they would gently be like, so it wasn't stressful for them or sort of anxiety provoking. They would get like sort of guided through this sort of, they were kind of like tunnels into the slaughterhouse in a way that was so they couldn't see what was happening in front of them. And it was like this really humane way to bring them there without just, you know, throwing them in and giving them all the anxiety of stress that they're about. Corralling to them and then here Yeah, them. yeah. And so I thought that was really humane. Plus the people in the vegetarian movement that hate her for that because mm -hmm. she made it, Right. That much more humane to kill an animal that the vegetarians didn't want killed in the first place. Yes, yes. So we can go deeper into that. But I, the yeah. answer is you don't need a brain, but you need, I think, a nervous system. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. All right, we, we got to go lightning round, Jackie. Lightning. lightning let, me, let me try to do Oh, there this we go. is scary. So we just have like, to do quick, like... Y yes, sound bites. We're going to do sound bites. Okay, here we go. Jackie, give it to me. From Sampan Gosal on Facebook, how are memories physically stored in the brain? Also, can we implant fabricated memories in some way? Ooh. Yes, they're, they're in Sanchi, they're, no, they're, uh, <laughs> in the brain via long-term, um, potentiation, which is a physical process that connects neurons to each other or makes them sort of what, what, Fires together, wires together. That's the quickest. Oh. Heavy in synapse, it's called. Cool. So the more they fire together, the more they will remain connected. Yes. In such yes. a way that they form a memory. Yeah. Next one, quick. Uh -huh. 
Uh, I've always been your Sancho on Instagram. What does it mean to focus on something? How does it work? Ooh, good one. And that means attention. To, attention. It's attention. And and what it is is that there's part of your brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that's activated. That's way too many syllables. When you you're the DFLPC. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> no DLFPC. Anyway, so you you can um, engage certain parts of your prefrontal cortex that filter out extraneous information, and your kind of mental energy is is focused on a particular bit of information. So part of the focus is taking away. Things Things that would distract. Yes, yes. And that's why people have problems with their attention is that they're too easily distracted. They're not good at, at focusing in because of the distractions. Cool. Got it. What? I'm sorry. Give me one more. Listening. Um, <laughs> Jack Perry 8 on Instagram. Will a brain transplant or full body transplant ever become a reality? That's what I want to know because uh, you, you have the, the Lou Gehrig's disease folks where their, bo their body decays. What is it? A a ALS. A ALS. ALS. Mm -hmm. And then you have the... Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's folks where their brain goes away. Yes. And I'm thinking in the future, you get the brain of the ALH person and put it in the body of the Alzheimer's well, person. Then you get one yeah. whole human there. Yeah. If only we could reconnect and regrow. Is that going to come? Uh, I, I don't think we're that we're close to it. Uh -huh. Okay. So I'm going to have to say no, but maybe in the next like the hundreds of years, 200 years, maybe. But if we can we figure can out how to We can put a man on the moon. You uh, can't give, do a brain transplant? I'm really, I highly doubt it. Yeah, I'm going to say no. That's a no. That's a no. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted lightning. You heard it you here first. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons why. We'll get into it later. Well, Dr. Frankenstein did a brain transplant. Yeah, he, he was. He got the Abbey Normal. That's they true. They did one on Star Trek brain. too, Spock's brain. Oh, I yeah. remember that. We can probably replace a brain with silicon at some point. Like silicon based, silicon based brain. But I don't you know about so? taking a biological human brain and putting it on another body. What you don't mean silicon, the element on the periodic table? You mean a computer brain? A computer brain. Yeah, that's oh. what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is if you can replace one neuron with a, a silicon chip that does exactly the same function on and off, and then another and another and another, at some point, in principle, can, in principle, you can replace and the whole brain. brain. Right, yeah, and right. inside a body. But would it? Dream. Oh. oh. <laughs> we have run out of time for this special neuroscience edition of Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Heather, as always, thanks for being such a friend of Star Talk. And you're one of our Star Talk All Stars. And it's always great to have you back. Um, you. And we don't see enough of you. So Aww. we should do every episode on the brain, don't you think, guys? Everything involves the brain. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie Hoffman, great. I'm going to try to get tickets to your Yiddish production, English subtitles, of <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof, and particularly yeah. with you playing Yenta. That's got to be hilarious. I like to think so <laughs> with my brain. Boy, this was exhausting, and I was the stupid one. <laughs> <laughs> So you've been listening to, possibly even watching, this episode of Star Talk. I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. As always, I bid you. <laughs>